Well, thank you so much for joining us today right here on PRN, Progressive Radio Network. You're here with Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. You can find us at naturalnurse.com. And you can also listen to our archives. This show is archived, so that's so great. So even if you um, miss a show, you also can join with us. And we have so many classes and workshops coming up really at all times. So this week, just coming very shortly, you can catch a live webinar that we are doing. And if you're listening to this show afterwards and you miss the live event, you still can catch it on the archive. And it's called Hemp Cannabis Sativa, Hows, Whys, and Wherefores. And this is a free event, but it does hold CE credits for professionals such as uh, RDs and NDs and DCs, those are chiropractors, but even if you're not one of those things, you still can take it. But for RDs, NDs, and chiropractors, it's a free webinar and you actually get um, a CE credit for taking it. And I'm going to go really in depth of the scientific research, clinical experience, and um, public participation about hemp, of course, it's an ongoing topic. You know, you, you can't ever get to a point where you know, where you go, okay, I know all about this because there's ongoing research. It's all updated almost daily. So that's something that's coming up. Again, you can take it tomorrow um, or anytime that you want because once you email me and find out where to sign up for it, and it is free, then you can catch it on the archive. Um, Also, we're having that same lecture live on ground in Florida at the Forest Hills Community Center in West Palm Beach. That's coming up November 21st, and that is free and open to all, and it has two CE units as well for licensed massage therapists. Anyone can come, but if you are a licensed massage therapist, you get two CE credits for it. We also have an online course that has three CEU credits for uh, and this is three, also for licensed massage therapists, registered dietitians, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, and midwives. And this is called Herbs for the Holy Days. So it's all about the herbs and plants that have used been used traditionally during this time of the year, and you do get credit for it. Um, you can find out more by going to naturalnurse.com calendar. We also have one coming up about Hildegard of Begin, mystic, psychic, visionary, herbalist. And of course, every single day, we have individual workshops, classes, and we take people through to be an RH. That's a registered herbalist. And I am a mentor with the American Herbalist Guild. So we are uh, certified to be able to take people through the process. There are other mentors as well. Many people do choose to you know, do that along with me. And we step by step get it all together so that you can become a recognized registered herbalist. But if you don't want to go that far and you just want to learn more about how to use herbs for yourself and your family, we have lots of classes like that as well, as well as specific things like how to market your herbal um, if you find you're making herbal handmade products, how do you market it legally? There's big things to know about that way before the FDA becomes your PayPal, uh, your pen pal. You want to know what you have to do to avoid that. Um, or if you just want to learn how to take care of your family for colds and flus over the winter, we have individualized classes and that going on all day every day. So you can get in touch at naturalnurse.com. Just contact us through there. You can also sign up for the newsletter, which is completely free. We only need your email, nothing else. And we don't send it out too often, like once a month or so, just to keep you up to date on what's going on. Or you can just check the website, naturalnurse.com calendar. That's where the classes are listed. So today we are so happy to bring on board as our guest here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z, Sherry Torcos. Sherry is a pharmacist, author, fitness instructor, and health enthusiast personally 
who enjoys sharing her passion with others. She graduated with honors from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, and since then she has been practicing holistic pharmacy in the Niagara region of Ontario, right over that northern border. Her philosophy of practice is to integrate conventional and complementary therapies to optimize health and prevent disease. She'll share some basic guidelines to follow. We're going to be, have a focus today on children, especially if they suddenly become ill, so that can help you decide to make the right call should you go right to the doctor's office or try home remedies first. You know, very nervous, especially for new parents, to make that decision. And to find out more, her website is Sherry, that's S-H-E-R-R-Y, Torcos, T-O-R-K-O-S, dot com. That's Sherry Torcos, dot com. And thank you so much for joining us today, Sherry, on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Hi there, Ellen. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for being with us today. Now, what made you decide to go into uh, being a pharmacist in the first place? Well, um, when I was in high school, I was, you know, you meet with the career counselors and the resource people, and I was strong in sciences. I was interested in health, and I spent some time volunteering in our local hospital and I worked in the pharmacy department for two summers, actually, as a volunteer. And that really piqued my curiosity in medicine and healing. I also spent some time in the OR with the, with the doctors, and I thought, well, at one point I was thinking maybe I'd like to be a doctor, but then I wasn't 100% sure about some aspects of the job. And so I decided to um, pursue my interest in science and health at pharmacy, in pharmacy. So I went to the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, and it was a fantastic education. It's a very small school. It's actually where pharmacy started in the 1800s. All of the, uh, the fathers of pharmacy got together and, and formed uh, my school. So it's a really strong heritage, and it was a great educational experience. And I spent five years learning all about health and disease states and primarily how we can manage it from a pharmaceutical perspective, although they did teach us a little bit about nutrition and phytotherapy. But it was really after I graduated from school that I began my journey to learn more about complementary medicines and integrative (laughs) approaches to health. Uh, because I was just genuinely, um, I was interested in those areas, and I also felt strongly that we shouldn't rely only on drugs to solve our health issues, because as you well know, many uh, conditions that affect our society today are, are largely rooted in lifestyle choices, so what we eat, sleep, stress, things like that. So you know, I began to take courses um, in natural medicine and go to conferences and learn as much as I could and then integrate that into the way I practice. Well, that's that's a very good. Thank you for sharing that. So you actually seem to have an interest in natural personally even before you got involved in pharmacy. And then it was sort of a professional um, walk to get that pharmacy degree. And then you increased your knowledge about natural interventions because unfortunately the education that most people get in a conventional pharmacy stool is pretty lacking. I'm finding what they are bringing in more now is not so much how to use herbs as a first line, let's say herbs and nutritional supplements and food, all of that, not so much about how to use that first, but how to be aware of um, the recently researched herb-drug interactions, which are very real as well. Right. I I would agree with that. Um, You know, it's better today than it was 25 years ago when I went to school where there was just, you know, it wasn't really as much a part of the mainstream and very little time and attention was spent learning about functional foods or nutritional foods and and herbs. Today, pharmacists do learn more about that, but as you mentioned, a, a key part of it is understanding drug herb interactions and you know there there's no way to know all possible interactions so we often look to 
how we understand a drug to work, how we understand the herb to work, and to see if there's any potential interactions. And in some, t- t- in some cases, the interactions are actually positive, where herbs can be used along with medications, maybe to use a lower dose or to offset side effects, or they um, can be used um, preventatively or first line. Uh, but I think there still is quite a way to go, really, um, when we look at, at how we can integrate the two worlds. That's a really good recap of what's going on in the herb drug interaction space right now. I really like that you brought up, Sherry, that it's not only negative, but sometimes it could be helpful to where you could combine the use safely and it often brings down the amount of the pharmaceutical you need for the same effect and that will lead to a lower adverse effect profile. Exactly, and, and there are lots of examples of that. Could you give us that? At... Could you give us one or two? Yeah, so sure. Um, I mean, if we look at one of the most popular classes of drugs, the cholesterol-lowering drugs, uh, such as Lipitor and others, they are effective in lowering cholesterol. However, they're very hard on the liver, and they also lead to one of their primary drawbacks that people experience is muscle weakness, muscle pain. There's a condition that we call it medically myopathy or more serious condition form of that, which is rhabdomyosis, which the, the, I've had patients where actually they've had breakdowns and holes develop in their muscles, <clears throat> excuse me, from taking these, these drugs. They're, the class of drugs is the statin drugs. And we know, um, and this has been borne out in research, that these drugs deplete a very important nutrient in our body called coenzyme Q10. And we had thought maybe 10, 20 years ago that possibly a depletion of coenzyme Q10 could be leading to these muscle issues that people are experiencing because coenzyme Q10 is very important in the mitochondria and driving energy production in the cells. And sure enough, it's been found that, yes, these drugs deplete Q10 and supplementing with Q10, if you're on statin drugs, that can often offset and prevent some of those side effects. Plus, coenzyme Q10 has so many other health benefits for heart health and and um, energy throughout the body and gum fighting off gum issues and things like that. Yes, so that's, and that's, that's one interesting. Example. In, on, in some audiences, for instance, if I'm lecturing, which I often do at pharmacy schools or to groups of physicians where they're interested in going even a little deeper in terms of the mechanism of action, what we find is in terms of CoQ10, the reason that those that specific class of drugs decreases the available CoQ10 is because our body tends to make its own CoQ10, but the right. exact pathway that is interfered with so that cholesterol does not build up is the same pathway that is necessary for the body to use to make its own CoQ10. So while it is lowering that cholesterol number, it's also interfering with some very important metabolic events on a cellular level, one of which is the internal creation of CoQ10. So I find that so interesting. Like the deeper we go, it doesn't erase our knowledge, but it sort of really adds to our understanding of why it's important to know what's going on. It's so complex. The body is not simple. I really feel that sometimes in medicine and particularly with pharmaceuticals, we're looking to make that just one isolated change, like bring some kind of number down. Right. And, and yet and we're missing when, some of those very intense um, applications and cycles that, that go on when we bring that number down. Exactly. And, and I think uh, it's been a long time coming just to even understand that particular interaction that we were discussing, the statin drugs and the CoQ10. You know, it took a while for them to understand why were CoQ10 levels going down so much. And then, as you mentioned, you know, it was found that, you know, it's, it, uh, by taking the statin drugs, it interferes with the production of Q10 in the, in the body. And then as a result of that, people get muscle weakness, muscle fatigue, et cetera. So um, I do, that is one good example where we can use uh, natural products complementary. And there's lots of other examples too, antibiotics and probiotics. And um, even when we look at how we manage 
some health transitions that women experience, menopause and andropause, lots of great examples where we can use natural products. And even with what we're discussing today, when it comes to children's health, I think often people are afraid, they worry, you know, can you give uh, dietary supplements or some of these natural products to children? And, and there are some really good examples where they are not only effective, but also probably safer. So, you know, when we get into it uh, today, I have some really good advice for your listeners about some things, some remedies that you can buy without a prescription, natural products, foods for special dietary use, and other things to help manage some of the common childhood issues that, that kids experience. Well, we definitely look forward to hearing about that, Sherry, because this is from a pharmacist. And so you're saying, you know, pharmaceuticals can certainly be necessary, but how do we decide if our child is ill at home? And I'm a grandmother, so I've been there many times. You know, when is the time to run to the emergency room, which is so traumatic if it's, you know, two in the morning and the child has symptoms? How do you make that call? Right. So you have to uh, look objectively at, at what's happening. I think sometimes, especially for first time or new young parents, there's a, a fear factor, a bit of a panic when your child, say, has a, a temperature or there's vomiting or diarrhea. And we instinctively think, okay, we got to take them to the doctors. But sometimes that can actually create more problems because, as you know, there when you're into the emergency room or the doctor's clinic, there's lots of germs going around, especially this time of year. And kids, especially, they put they touch things, they put their hands in their mouths, and sometimes it you know you're taking them there with good intentions, but you could be exposing them to more potential bugs or problems. So, you know, if we look at, at one of the, um, the most common things that, that affect kids when they are coming down with something, fever, there is a lot of worry when that, that body temperature goes up. Parents feel, oh, no, I've, I've got to give some medication to get the fever down or I've got to take the child to the doctor. But not all fevers need to be medicated. And I often will, will tell parents uh, to understand that when the body raises its core temperature, it's doing that to fight off a potential invader. So fever is, is naturally what happens in our body as we're trying to fight off um, some type of a bug. And so what you want to do is, is monitor the fever, and I would recommend using an ear thermometer. I, I don't like using old cell mercury thermometers or even the back of the hand is really, I mean, you can tell with the back of your hand if the child's warm, but then you should get the thermometer out, and I, I use ear thermometers. I think they're very effective, easy to use, especially with, with young children. And check the child's temperature, and you really don't have to panic in, in, until it starts to get up there beyond 103, 104. Then, then I would say that's time to make a call to the doctor. But if it's, you know, 100, 101, 102, keep the child comfortable, cool compresses on their forehead, make sure you give them lots of fluids so they don't get dehydrated, and uh, not you don't want to put the child into an ice bath, although, you know, I've heard parents say, oh, well, should I put them in a cold bath? No, because that causes them to shiver, and that can actually work against what you're trying to do. So you don't need to rush to the doctor, but if that fever gets really high, or if you have a young child, say a child that's three months of age or younger, and the fever is only at 100, that's more concerning because infants, their, their immune systems are developing and things can rapidly escalate into more serious situations. So you would want to take an infant in if the infant has a higher fever. And also if there's a child that is say, pulling at their ear or they tell you their neck hurts, if there's vomiting or diarrhea or even signs of seizures occurring, then those are more medical emergencies you need to see the doctor. And so what kind of fever number are you talking about, Sherry Torcos, in terms of what might be time to run to the emergency room? Right. So with uh, an infant, as I mentioned, if that fever gets up to be 100 or 100.4, then I would take the infant to the doctor. But for older children, you can try to keep them comfortable at home if the fever is 100, 101, 102. But once it goes above 103, that's when I would say with an older child, it's time to make that call or, or take your child to the doctor. And now, how do you feel as a health professional about what's coming up now, which is telemedicine, where you can sometimes, you know, actually have the child on a video call with the doctor? 
I think that's very helpful, actually. And and aside from video calls, but even just be a parent being able to call in to get good medical advice and spare yourself the trip to the emergency room, I think that's a great uh, way to access good medical information and, and recommendations so that you know when, when it is appropriate to take the child in. So I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of that. I do think that's, that can be very helpful. And I would caution parents against Googling too much because although, you know, we, we tend to Google symptoms, sometimes you can come up with other things that can make you more nervous or it might not be qualified advice. That's true. That's a double-edged sword also because I've seen people Google their symptoms and find something that really closely matches it that the doctor never thought about. But, you know, you have to bring it up gingerly because they don't like to be told, well, maybe it's this, you know, you haven't found anything else. But anyway, it is all a double-edged sword that I think it's we're all making our baby steps through that. But a lot of your advice is so wonderful because it's based in both traditional knowledge, and that's like, let's say, long-term knowledge that parents used to know more about, actually, in the old days, along with the latest information from the world of pharmacology as well as pharmacognosy. So I think your advice is, is really grounded both in, in um, the future and in long-term tradition. Well, you know, as, as we were discussing, drugs have their, their place, but it is my feeling as a pharmacist we only need, should be using drugs when they're absolutely necessary because sometimes the side effects, like if we look at some of the fever-reducing medications, things like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, you can give those to a child. Uh, you have to make sure you're giving the right dose based on, on the age and the weight. But you have to be careful because if you give too much, in the case of acetaminophen, it's hard on the liver. In the case of ibuprofen, very hard on the stomach and even on the kidneys. So these are things you have to use very carefully, although you can get them without a prescription in the pharmacy. I always check with the pharmacist or doctor for what the appropriate usage and dosage would be. Well, that sounds we're going to go to a little break right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. You can listen to um, a natural medicine chest vignette. And when we come back, we're going to go right into some very specific information that Sherry Torcos can share with us. And you may want to visit her website. You can see all the great information there in her blog at SherryTorcos.com. We'll be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. On this edition of The Natural Medicine Chest, we'll discuss an herb we all know and love, cinnamon. Ah, the spicy, sweet smell of cinnamon. Everyone recognizes the familiar aroma of this common kitchen spice. But did you know that cinnamon is an exotic plant bark with a long history of medicinal use in many countries throughout the world? Cinnamon was listed as an herb with medicinal properties in Chinese literature as early as 2700 BC. It is described in the Chinese medical text, the Tang Materia Medica, written in 659 AD. Cinnamon also enjoys traditional use in Ayurvedic medicine, the ancient healing art of India. It is mentioned in the Book of Moses and has been cultivated in Ceylon and Sri Lanka since 1200 AD, where much of the world's supply is still grown. In Europe, cinnamon was regarded as a rare and precious spice. Many pharmaceutical substances such as cough syrups and digestive tonics contain cinnamon. It was also used as an incense and in perfumes. According to Chamberlain, writing in France in 1887, cinnamon possesses the greatest antiseptic properties. Cinnamon is gathered from the dried inner bark of the branches of a small tropical evergreen laurel tree. The bark is peeled off and as the pieces are dried, they curl up into quills. These are the common cinnamon sticks that are used in herb teas and for baking. In Chinese medicine, cinnamon is one of the most widely used warming herbs to aid in circulation and digestion. It is a common ingredient in small amounts in tea used for nausea during pregnancy. It is also used following delivery to decrease hemorrhage. Cinnamon raises vitality, warms and stimulates all the vital functions of the body, counteracts congestion, improves the digestive system, relieves abdominal spasms, and aids in peripheral circulation. 
The essential oils contained in cinnamon include eugenol, cinnamonic aldehyde, methyl eugenol, tannins, and mannitol, which give cinnamon its sweet flavor. It also contains cinzenolin and cinzenolol, which are both known insecticides. Try putting some liquid soap and cinnamon in a spray bottle and use on plants as an organic bug repellent. Cinnamon is also included in many medicinal recipes that are used for lice, scabies, and other skin parasites. Cinnamon has antifungal, antiviral, and bactericidal activities. It has been shown to suppress E. coli, Staphylococcus, and Candida albicans. So listeners, the next time you inhale that sweet, spicy aroma, remember there's more to cinnamon than meets the nose as you reach into your natural medicine chest. Welcome back once more to the Natural Nurse and Dr. Z right here on Progressive Radio Network, uh, your network for natural lis- listening and all kinds of progressive information. And thank you so much for joining us here today. This is Ellen Kamai, the Natural Nurse, and you can find me or contact me at naturalnurse.com. Click on calendar to find many of the classes and workshops that we're giving. Those are usually group classes, group workshops. They're both online. They have CE credits for RDs, nurses, midwives, licensed massage therapists, NDs, which are naturopathic doctors, chiropractors. Most professionals do get some kind of credits from taking our classes, but if you would like to just take them for your own knowledge, that's completely fine. And we also give classes to upgrade really um, your qualifications. For instance, if you wanted to be a professional herbalist, an RH, a registered herbalist through the American Herbalist Guild, we take you through that process. Or if you wanted to know more about holistic nursing or the American Cannabis Nurses Association, which is a really up-and-coming organization, and I work on committees with that group as well. So if you want to just learn personally how to use natural remedies for yourself and your family, that's also something we can schedule on an individual level. Just go to naturalnurse.com and go to contact. Our guest today is Sherry Torcos, and Sherry is a pharmacist, author, fitness instructor, and health enthusiast, and she is highly trained in conventional pharmacy, but she chooses to integrate conventional and complementary therapies to optimize health and prevent disease. Her website is sherrytorcos.com. And thank you so much for joining us today, Sherry. Hey there. Thank you for having me. And you're also an author. I know you um, contributed to the Canadian Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine and the Glycemic Index Made Simple. That's important. Yeah, um, the encyclopedia is, um, I've actually done two editions with that book. Um, The first one came out um, just before I had my son, so it was about 10 years ago now. And then I did uh, did really well, and we updated it and did a second edition. And uh, folks can uh, find out information about my books and what I do on my website, which is sherrytorkus.com. It's S-H-E-R-R-Y-T-O-R-K-O-S. And I've also posted a blog on my website if you're interested in some of the recommendations for the issues that we're talking about today, when to make the call to the doctor. I have all of my tips summarized, uh, what to do with fever, vomiting and diarrhea, which I know we're going to discuss next, um, and also colds and rashes. So there's great information on my website, and I encourage uh, your listeners to check it out. Well, that's Good. Thank you for sharing that, Sherry. And let us check that out now. So, you know, looking sort of at topics, two topics, you went over fever a little bit. Um, So Mm -hmm. why don't we talk about digestive difficulties? And those are really scary to parents, like um, vomiting and loose stools and, you know, it goes on. And of course, a child, you hear horror stories about people getting dehydrated, and that is a concern. So what would you say that a parent should do when that's happening? 
Well, I would say that if, if it's just a single episode with either vomiting um, or a loose stool, I, I wouldn't panic or worry. I don't think you need to see the doctor at that point. I mean, kids put their hands in their mouths. They encounter all kinds of different bugs and germs. You, you don't necessarily need to um, give something um, immediately in those circumstances. Now, just like we were talking about earlier with fever and how that's the body's natural way to respond to a potential invader or bug. That's what's happening also with vomiting and diarrhea. The body is trying to purge itself and eliminate a potential bug. And so it can go from both ends, and sometimes it does happen at the same time, which can be really tricky, especially this time of year with all the, the viruses going around. Um, you might have heard the term, listeners have heard of stomach flu, which isn't really influenza, but it's often caused by other types of viruses that cause both vomiting and loose stool. But I do have some great advice on how you can manage these things at home. And I would start off by saying the key concern is to prevent dehydration with both vomiting or loose stool because if the body is getting rid of a lot of fluids, there is that risk of dehydration, which can be a greater concern, especially with young ones. So you want to give the child, as soon as they're not vomiting, able to keep something down and also with a loose stool, I would give something like a pediatric electrolyte solution, something like uh, Pedialyte or the, the store brand, because it has the right balance of sugar and salt and water uh, that is important to prevent dehydration. I wouldn't give things like ginger ale or juices. There's just too much sugar in those beverages. I mean, it, real ginger ale would be an exception or a ginger tea would be helpful uh, I would, you know, those can be um, used as well, but the, the uh, Pedialyte is a great option. And the other thing I would point out is if you are in the pharmacy, uh, keep in mind that the remedies that are targeted for diarrhea, Imodium and other types of products like that, they're not actually recommended for children. There's only one remedy that you will see in pharmacies that's not a drug. It's actually a food for special dietary use that's safe to give to children as young as one year of age, and that is called Dia Rescue, and that's D-I-A-R-E-S-Q. And it contains colostrum along with egg solids. And I had the opportunity, I've done some consulting work with this company to review their science. Uh, very impressive um, because, first of all, it is not a drug. It actually helps the body to restore normal intestinal function and balance because you've got the colostrum and the egg solids, which provide those vital nutrients and immune factors that the system is needing to get back to normal. And um, so it's very effective. Their, their research shows that it can resolve most cases of pediatric diarrhea within 24 hours. So the Dia Rescue actually comes in, in formats for children, and then there's also a format for adults. And you get three packets in a box, and you just mix it with water. You can give it right at the onset if the child has loose stool or diarrhea, and um, it works very, very effectively. So that's Well, let's talk that about colostrum see. a little bit, because what mm -hmm. is that, and why would it be helpful, do you think, in a situation of sort of a digestive upset? Well, colostrum is, is that mother's first milk. It's the first form of milk that's produced um, by the mammary glands and in humans. And um, when we breastfeed, that is, it comes out as like a, a little bit of a yellow nectar. They always call it that golden nectar. It's, it's, it's one of the most perfect and most incredible foods to give um, a newborn child. And colostrum is used um, therapeutically to help address a number of, of digestive issues because it contains um, very important um, immune cells and, and, and antibodies and nutrients. And so it has been used and researched for a wide number of, of different health issues, including um, digestive distress. So uh, in the case of the Dia Rescue, it's actually bovine colostrum. So it's not human colostrum, it's, it's bovine colostrum combined again with egg solids. Um, showing that it can be um, very, very effective. And I think what, what I like about this strategy is you're not giving a drug which has potential side effects that actually most of the drugs that are used for diarrhea, they work by slowing down intestinal movements or peristalsis. 
which is kind of counterintuitive because if you have something in your system, you want to get it out and you want to restore your, your, your digestive system. You don't necessarily want to take something that is going to slow things down. And I've had people that have taken some of those other diarrhea remedies and then they get constipated or they run into other issues. So um, I like the idea that this is, again, something that just works with the body to help restore balance. So it's a, it's a great uh, product, not only for, to keep on in your medicine cabinet for those you know, episodes of diarrhea that can occur, but also if you're traveling, if you're going to Mexico or South America or different countries where you're exposed to different water, different foods that might have different microorganisms, traveler's diarrhea is a really big issue. And I know so it's a good thing probably to take with you because you might not find that on the shelf too easily. Yeah, and not only that, but if you're traveling and you're going to, say, a resort and you're staying on the resort compound, when these things happen, say you, you get an episode of diarrhea, they, they may not have anything at the resort that you can even find to treat that, and, and some of the things that they do carry are not for kids. And then if you have to make a journey into a local village or town, there's language barriers or other things. So um, I, this is something that I carry with us when we travel. I'm planning a trip to Mexico in December with my son, and it's one of the um, several things that I'll be packing in my natural medicine um, carry-on uh, bag so that I have things on hand to, um, to be able to react if, if the situation arises. So... Um, you know, back to, you know, the, the recommendations. So the Dire Rescue is great. Uh, you would also, from a, a food perspective, I would recommend giving the child a bland diet for a few days. So stay away from packaged, prepared foods, spicy foods. I would give, um, you know, ginger is great if, if your child, ginger can be a bit pungent, but it is good. Um, it's okay to give uh, a good quality yogurt, things like that, bananas, rice, crackers, those types of foods and lots of fluids. Well, those are great suggestions. Now, of course, as we head into, you know, colder weather is coming in the Northeast, not for me, because I'm in Florida, but (laughs) for those Northeasterners or Canadians like yourself who have to deal with that, um, there seems to be an uptick in colds, flus, and respiratory problems in the colder weather. Is that true, or is that an old wives' tale, that really we have those things all year round? Well, they, they can occur all year round, but we do see a spike, a significant spike in the incidence of cold and flu during the colder winter months. So for those of us that are exposed to, like right now I'm looking at my window and we have about two feet of snow. And what happens during the winter months is that the viruses have a greater ability to survive and um, be transmitted because in the colder temperatures, the air is drier and the viruses thrive in where the humidity is low, but also during the colder times of year, we spend more, in do- in, more time indoors closer to one another, and so it becomes easier to transmit those, those bugs. And so with both cold and flu, uh, there are a number of things that we can do uh, from a home management perspective not both of these infections, colds and flus, are caused by viruses, so there is no need to give antibiotics. And I, I tell people this all the time. Uh, I know often people come in and say, uh, I want a recommendation for something over the counter, and then they say, well, I'm going to go to the doctor. I think I need to get antibiotics. Well, you know, I always take the time to explain to people that when you have a viral infection, a cold or a flu, there is no value in giving an antibiotic. In fact, it can sometimes do more harm than good because it can affect your digestive system, it can cause diarrhea, and also the inappropriate use of antibiotics can lead to resistance, and that's a real public health issue that, um, that we're battling. So what I would recommend for cold and flu would be to stay home and get rest because the body needs time to recover and recuperate. Sometimes people will try to push through and they don't want to miss work. And, and by sending your children to school, are you going to work yourself if you're sick? You're not allowing the body that recuperation time. So you want to stay home and rest, drink lots of fluids. I'm also a big proponent of echinacea. There are certain types of echinacea, echinacea purpurea in particular, that's been very well studied and found to be effective not only for prevention but also to help minimize symptoms and speed healing. Vitamin C, especially in people that are not getting enough through diet, those under stress, smokers, 
Vitamin C is helpful. Zinc, chicken soup and herbal teas. Uh, honey is great for a cough and a sore throat and is safe for those one year of age and older. So those are some of the things that I would recommend uh, to help manage colds and, and flu and respiratory symptoms. Could you share with me why there is that belief, and I'm not sure about the science behind it, in terms of uh, children younger than one year old not being able to use honey? Well, I think it's it's a fear of something called botulism. And um, the evidence on that, I haven't looked at it recently, but um, it has been long, it's been long recommended that um, botulism, which it can be very, um, it can be fatal, especially in infants and young children. And so I think there is a fear depending on um, honey because it can contain botulism spores, and then the spores can release toxins um, that can be very dangerous and even fatal to ch- infants and small children. So it is a, a recommendation from CDC and Mayo Clinic and other health organizations um, to avoid giving honey to infants because of that risk of botulism. Now, I don't know how high that risk is. Obviously, it would, be prepare, it would depend on how the honey is prepared, and, you know, but just to be safe, I wouldn't recommend giving it to, to those less than one. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very, very good advice. And we're going to take a little break right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z so that the uh, wonderful station that we come to you from, which is Progressive Progressive Radio Network, you can always find out more at prn.fm. Our shows are posted there as well as many of the other wonderful presentations that Progressive Radio Network offers. So we'll be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Yeah, I'm not known as a gadget guy, but I love gadgets that really do the trick, like the new app. The Progressive Radio Network has an app, thanks to our friends at Audio Now. Hey, this is Mark Farrell, host to Insight on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we broadcast live out of New York City. But if you can't catch the show live, no frets. It's always archived. It's always on the app. Download it now. Listen now. Listen later whenever you want. The Progressive Radio Network app is available from our friends at Audio Now. Check it out. I'm Dr. Peter Bregan, a psychiatrist who doesn't believe in psychiatric drugs and psychiatric diagnoses. I think they do more harm than good. And emotional problems don't come from our genetics or our chemistry. They come from our fears and our uncertainties about engaging life in a loving, rational way. Every Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. New York time, I interview fellow pioneers in the human sciences. Call in to ask questions or share your views on 888-874-4888 to talk with me and my guests live on the air on Wednesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. New York time. Join me on prn.fm. interested in growing a greener future? Do you enjoy healthy, nutritious food? Would you like to learn how to grow your own organic oasis in an easy and efficient way? I'm Jackie Marie Beyer, the humble host of the Organic Gardener podcast, where I talk with amazing guests who are all using sustainable, earth-friendly practices. I interview backyard gardeners, market farmers, and people who have green businesses related to food. I'd love it if you'd join us on the Progressive Radio Network, coming on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. You are listening to PRN, Progressive Radio Network. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. Please visit us at naturalnurse.com because that's where we get your messages 
and we can get back to you. And, of course, you can also visit Facebook, The Natural Nurse, and we're right there at Facebook, Natural Nurse. Uh, You'll find all kinds of postings and lectures and workshops. I think we have some of our events actually on Facebook as well, although the most efficient way to find them is to just go to naturalnurse.com calendar, and there we have clicks to so you can see what the class is about who can get CE credits. Again, maybe you don't need any, so you don't have to worry about the CE credits. You can take the class anyway for your own health knowledge and how to sign up. So go ahead and visit naturalnurse.com calendar or email us there or visit us at Facebook, The Natural Nurse. Today, we are so happy to have health expert Sherry Torcos, who is a pharmacist, author, and fitness instructor, and health enthusiast. I love that about you, Sherry, because you really practice this with yourself and your family. It's just not an academic interest. Yeah, well, it's something I am very passionate about, and so when anybody in my house or even my extended family, they encounter a health issue, you know, I'm first looking to, okay, what can we do from a dietary perspective? What supplements, what natural ways can we manage what we're facing? And in some cases, if a medication's necessary, then we go that route. But it's it's always the last resort, um, which people will say is funny and it's almost ironic because I'm a pharmacist. But, you know, I do believe these drugs have uh, definitely a place in, in treating health issues but I also know full well the side effects and consequences of using medications. And I think because over my career I've seen so many examples where people have suffered because of taking medications, either wrong dose or interactions or inappropriate use of something. And, you know, there, there's, there's risks and dangers. So, you know, I just think it's important for people to be aware of their options and to look at those options and, again, try to address things naturally if possible. I so much agree with you. They have their place. We don't want to throw out anything. But I think the order in which they're used needs to be reevaluated and reassessed to where as healthcare professionals, whether you are a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist or a patient or an individual, and of course all of us can also have several of those roles, the first thing to do is that which looks like it is the most effective with the lowest rate of side effects. And then if that doesn't work, we can move up that ladder with something that's stronger, knowing we're taking a risk, but the risk is worth it because it may also be life-saving in that situation. But I think they are so overused, especially for things which are really better addressed through something like diet and exercise, which should not be the last intervention tried, but the first intervention tried. Exactly. I, I really believe um, wholeheartedly in that approach. And, you know, I've, and I've seen the benefits in, in um, people taking charge of their health and, and making the lifestyle changes and eating better and using supplements. And sometimes it takes a real health scare or something really bad to happen to motivate people. But then also, I, you know, I'm seeing more and more people today that are interested in, in just, you know, learning more and doing what they can um, to, to take care of themselves in a, in a healthier way. Boy, that is, a, that is a special word, motivation. That is a special word, and thank you for sharing it. For instance, yesterday I got a report of a young man who I had worked with him and his mother brought him in. Not that young, but like 16. At 16, you know as a mother or a grandmother like myself, you can't put food in that child's mouth. That's got to be from their own hand, right? We're not talking about two. And so he had a a large array of digestive difficulties like you discussed. And so we talked about diet and we talked about his gluten sensitivity. So because I gave him that talk, he went on it strictly for two weeks. His mom got back to me and said, oh, my God. Um, he, he was going to get an endoscopy, which is a pretty invasive test. They said they don't even have to do that because everything's fine. And that lasted a few weeks. And then he went back to eating the offending food. So how do you how do you increase motivation? That would be great. I'd love to know that. 
<laughs> so would well, you probably, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, you, you're not feeling good, you're suffering, and then you take away the offending food and you feel better, I would think that would be motivating. And, and I have a similar, very personal story in that I suffered myself with celiac disease undiagnosed even before I went into pharmacy school, and that was really my first eye-opening experience to um, how, what happens to the body when it is starved of the right nutrients because I became very nutrient deficient. But I also had horrible gastrointestinal symptoms and rash and headaches and fatigue, and I had no idea that something that was prevalent in my diet, like gluten, was poisoning me. It took about 10 years to get a diagnosis Um, And for me, I was keenly motivated to stay gluten-free because I remembered how it felt when I had bloating and gas and diarrhea and my headache and rash and all those, I was depressed and those horrible things. So everybody comes to their point, what motivates them in their own way. And it's, you can't really will that on somebody else. I've, I've found I you know, can talk to people, try to inspire and encourage them. But generally, it's just giving them that information. And, and it, they have to reach that point where they feel motivated or they care enough about themselves and their health to, to make those changes. Yeah, it's it's a hard one as someone who's been in this field a long time. I guess it's also hard for me to, to relate to because I guess for me personally, I feel so motivated to do it that I don't actually, let's say, emotionally understand why people would want to take actions that make them feel worse. But, you know, that that's just my limitation. So thank you for sharing that. Now let's go on. We have a few minutes left. What about rashes? Because that's something that, you know, people often worry about and sometimes, you know, they come and go and it's not something that requires a trip to the doctor. Exactly. And and rashes are frequent, especially with children, as their bodies are being exposed to different foods, different clothing, different products in their baths or in their lotions and things that they encounter maybe at school. I mean, there are so many potential things that can trigger a rash. And it's one of those tricky symptoms because you know, it's sometimes trial and error, changing up the laundry soaps at home or changing the child's diet, for example, undiagnosed celiac, but also undiagnosed lactose intolerant or wheat sensitivity. There are so many different food sensitivities that can cause rash. And then it can also be caused by certain infections. Uh, there are certain viral infections and childhood illnesses like hand, foot, and mouth disease and other things that can cause Um, different types of rash. So I wouldn't panic when the rash first starts. I would um, recommend using something, uh, a natural product to help soothe and calm the skin down. So read your ingredients carefully. Look for things like vitamin E, uh, coconut oil, almond, um, also zinc, which is a really good um, protective um, ingredient in, in ointment, especially for diaper rash area too. But those things can help to soothe and protect, protect and hydrate the skin. I wouldn't panic unless the rash starts spreading quickly or if there are raised red sores or if the skin is hot, is swelling, or if there's oozing that could indicate infection. Those are situations where you'd want to make that call or get to the doctor's office. But if it's, if it's just a, you know, isolated little bit of a rash here or there, I, I wouldn't really panic and I would maybe try to make some dietary adjustments or, or talk to a healthcare practitioner um, for some advice on, on potential uh, changes that could be helpful. Well, that's always a good thing. And what about sort of, you know, what about your feelings about probiotics? Like some people are taking so many millions and millions of that every single day. Is that necessary for adults and children? And are there possible negative effects from overdoing it? Well, probiotics um, have certainly become very, very popular. And they do have areas where they are uh, where there's good evidence showing benefits, so for treating um, digestive issues, gas, bloating, constipation, irritable bowel, they can be helpful for that. Even Crohn's disease and colitis, there are specific strains of probiotics. But the thing is, there are so many different strains, and they all have research in different areas. Some are beneficial for immune system health. For example, um, in children, there's, there's good evidence Um, for certain types of lactobacillus bacteria showing that they can help to ward off 
um, respiratory infections in children. They can help to support absorption of nutrients from the body. Uh, it's really not a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's, my recommendations when it comes to probiotics is often very tailored depending on the person's uh, individual state of health and what their goals are, what their issues are. So it's not something I would say everybody can benefit. Everybody should take them. It's it's really individualized. So, I mean, there is a website where I serve as an advisor. It's probiotics.com, and there's a, a survey there where you can actually go online, fill out a survey, and it can guide you in getting advice in terms of which type of probiotic may be beneficial for you. But um, I take them myself um, because I have celiac disease. People with celiac tend to have issues with imbalances in microflora. I feel better. My digestion is better when I take one. And my son, he's on a probiotic as well. I think if anybody is taking an antibiotic, which whether it's for a sinus infection or whatever the case may be, really important to take a good quality probiotic to restore and replenish the beneficial bacteria that will get knocked away by taking the antibiotic. So again, there are certain circumstances where I do think they're warranted, um, but it's not really a one-size-fits-all approach. Well, that is certainly excellent information. Right. I tend, if somebody just wants one, and I haven't done a full workup like what you're talking about, where specific probiotics may be indicated, as well as prebiotics, which are the food that feeds the probiotics. And they they really are getting very deep in terms of the knowledge about which one, how much, and for whom. So that's an evolving science. But when I don't have all that background information, I really like to go with a simple thing, something just like acidophilus and bifidus, rather than Mm -hmm. some of the newer ones that show, you know, 12 to 25 different new strains that are, are there. Right. Exactly, and and there is, uh, like, the majority of the research has been done on different types of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, so lactobacillus acidophilus or lactobacillus gasseri, those are very well studied, bifidobacterium bifidum and longum, good research there. There's a combination of microorganisms called the friendly trio, um, which have been very well studied for digestive benefits, also helping to quell inflammation in the body. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating area. I mean, there's a lot of emerging research showing probiotics may turn out to be beneficial for even helping manage depression and fight off gum disease. I mean, there are some really interesting areas being, invest- being investigated right now. Yes, that's so true. Well, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today, Sherry, and just give one more shout out on how people can best connect with you. Yeah, so folks can check out my website. It's sherrytorkus.com, S-H-E-R-R-Y-T-O-R-K-O-S. Check out sherrytorkus.com. I've got some great information on my website, and I encourage uh, your listeners to check out my blog page for specific recommendations on what we talked about today. Well, thank you. And thank you, listeners, for joining us once again right here on PRN on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Until next time, this is Ellen Kamai at naturalnurse.com. On behalf of myself and Dr. Eugene Zamperone, we stay wishing you the best and stay healthy. Stay healthy.